morning again. Um, you know, when we prepare for a Sunday service, we're, we're not oblivious to what's going on in the world around us, and it does cause us to pause a minute when we've prepared something. But I, I want us to take a, um, a moment to, of silence beforehand, because we really are experiencing some tumult in the, in the world, and it's, it's here in the United States. So um, as was mentioned here about your daughter in, in, um, in Israel right now, in Jerusalem, um, the, the tragedy that's going on in Jerusalem, in, in, in Israel and Palestine, um, the recent death of uh, Samantha Wall, who was the president of, the, um, of a synagogue in Detroit over the weekend, um, and um, uh, Elami, uh, who was a six-year-old Muslim child that was killed in Illinois, and his mom was also stabbed, although she survived, um, is part of what we experience. So before I continue, I just want us to reflect on that and take just a quick moment of silence to, to know that we are part of this world and part of hope in this world. Thank you. Um, so I'm honored to, to serve as your lay minister, and I look forward to our journey together, because it's a journey together um, <clears throat> as we focus on um, our spiritual underpinnings of what, who we are as Unitarian Universalists. And in our guest today, most people come and they're Unitarian Universalists before they realize they're Unitarian Universalists. Um, but it's mostly because we come because we want a free and uh, and respectful but honest search for our truth in our life. And that's a free, that's, a, that's what kind of guides us. And then the other principles are very important um, because what we believe does matter. And um, as the readings have said beforehand, um, there's magic in that and there's actual um, uh, saying what we believe and writing down what we believe gives us a baseline. Do things change? Of course they do. And part of sometimes when you think of, of the, the rainbow song that was just so beautifully done, um, sometimes our journey takes us right back to where we started, which is beautiful because it confirms things that have been important to us for a long time. And sometimes the journey takes us to other places. So spiritual journey. Um, the word spiritual can be tough for some folks in the room. So let me just talk a little bit about that. Um, what is the light inside of you, okay, that shines both inside and outside? What's the quiet candle that when you meditate gives you guidance? Um, how are you connected to the world? How are you connected to our environment? How are you connected to the earth? How are you connected to each other? How do we connect to the energy that we might call God, the universe, the transcendent, the mystical part of our lives. Spirituality doesn't have to be religious, and it certainly doesn't have to be exclusively secular. It is really both. It's using our rational mind and our emotions, our emotive self. Um, and that what does is by bringing them both together, we get to be a more authentic person and we get to be a more loving and caring community. So we mentioned about uh, the reading of what, we're gonna, what we've let go, what we've um, kind of kept to some degree, and what we've added. And um, let me just say that um, my purpose today is to stimulate your thinking about your journey. So I'm just gonna share some tidbits of mine, and then I'm gonna have two other people um, share a little bit about their journey, just to give you an idea of what, what we were thinking. But we're one among everyone here, and everyone has our own journey. Um, <clears throat> let me start by, uh, when I was in seventh grade, we had earth science class. Okay, anybody remember earth science class? All right, so earth science class was fascinating to me. And what I learned about was, first of all, the atmosphere. Okay, that we breathe, okay, the, what we're in, the troposphere, right? 
and then you go up to the stratosphere and all the way up to the magnetosphere. It sounds like a sci-fi movie. And beyond to our planets, the sun, the other stars, cosmoses, and the universe. Really fascinating, right? And then you learned about gravity. We're not on a flat earth, right? We're round. So we're actually, everybody's facing out, right? On this world and gravity's keeping us grounded, but we're literally from any point of view outside of the earth, we could be upside down at any minute, right? And so um, that's something that's to think about, right? And then we're on this crust we, we occupy, then we have the mantle, the, the outer core with its liquid molten iron nickel alloy that generates the earth's magnetic field. And, um, and then we go down to the inner core. And you know, it's like, you think about that, and I'm not here to give us a science lesson, Okay, but what I learned from science completely changed my spirituality. And one thing that I didn't fully grasp at the time, but nonetheless, I realized its significance because it led to this core change in my religious upbringing. So one day, as a good introvert would do, would do I was laying on the grass in my front yard just looking up. Kelly, when we got married, she's like, Peter, what are you doing? I'm laying on the couch. I said, I'm laying on the couch. I'm not doing anything. That's what an introvert does, okay? So, um, so anyway, so I'm laying on the grass. I'm looking up. I'm seeing the beautiful blue sky, the clouds. It was wonderful, the pine trees, the maple trees. And I realized that there was no heaven like the heaven I was taught, just these atmospheric layers. And below me, there wasn't this hell that we were trying to put, well, all the non-Catholics in. Um, and, <laughs> and so, just a joke for my Catholic friends. Um, so, um, but uh, there was no hell below us. There was a lot of molten, you know, lava that would come up periodically through crevices and volcanoes. Um, but at middle school, that was kind of a big deal for me. And it didn't stop me from going to Catholic Mass with my family every Sunday, but it did stop me from going to religious education because most of the religious educators were volunteers and they were parents of my friends. And I really felt that I would be disrespectful because I was questioning everything that they were telling us. And so I stopped doing that. Now you probably have had similar experiences, whether it was in middle school or high school or as adults, where we finally said, hmm, that just doesn't make sense. Um, I wanna share a reading from a, a, a book. I call these epiphany moments that we have in our spiritual journey thresholds. And I borrowed this term from Joyce Rupp in a book that she, called, uh, that, that she wrote called Open the Door. Um, as your th thoughts about life and religion, your spiritual beliefs, your secular, your secular understandings, they change, you stand on a threshold um, on one side, you stand with your old beliefs, on the other with your new. Now a threshold contains the power of transformation. In this place of uncertainty, we're gonna make a decision and we're gonna be forced to confront a reality. In this reading, I find chal the challenge, but I find hope. And Joyce Rupp says, quote, this is where you yield to the necessary gestation that grows us into greater freedom. During this time, we let go of old ego ways we formerly re relied on to defend us from insecurity or facilitate resistance. All one's energies must be given to the process that readies us for the next tentative step of development. Threshold times cleanse us of false perceptions and wean us from feeding on what no longer nurtures us. These passageways serve as spiritual wombs where the soul grows stronger wings in spite of doubts of whether those wings can soar freely. Threshold experiences contain tremendous energy they hold the power to unglue and shake us deeply, to unfold us with seemingly empty darkness that causes us to yearn for relief. 
They can set an imprisoned spirit free, nurse a wounded heart back to health, and bring peace to the desolate soul. End of quote. All right, now here's the hard part. You got one leg on one side of the threshold. You got the other on the other side of the threshold. And I can tell you one thing, the gap is only going to grow wider. And it's not going to feel good. I can believe me, I've been there, OK? So you got two choices. Actually, you got three. All right, first choice is many religions will tell you that when you start to question, OK, or doubt, what you must do is you must bring that leg that stands in freedom and truth back to orthodoxy, OK? Because these dogmatic truths have come down from the millennia. And by gosh, they may not make sense. They may actually be wrong. They could be hurtful. But that's not what's important. What's important is that we stay on this side, OK? And we've been there. Many of us have been there, right? Now, if you don't abide by their rules, what happens? Well, you suffer their wrath, just like the heretics that have gone before us, OK? Ostracizing, belittling, shunning, false accusations, in the past, even torture and death. But we as Unitarian Universalists have been heretics for a long time. And we are still here. Why? Because the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, our fourth principle, is the underpinning of a free and democratic society. And that underpinning is what keeps us going and actually keeps our society going. So the second choice is probably what we've made, everybody in this room, is that you got to jump across the chasm. And you got to start your new faith journey in freedom and joy. Now, one time, Kelly gave me a, a little sign. And it said, leap, and the net will appear. And I said, that's not me. <laughs> Maybe when I was 21. <laughs> but you know, you got to have some community. you got to have support to get over that threshold. And that's why we're here together, because we have to support one another. That little, that middle part can be scary. And, and it doesn't end. Like, we literally could have another threshold next year and say, you know what? I need to move to a, a new direction altogether. So that's why I want us to be here for each other, so that we can connect and support each other as we move in our spiritual journey. It's not always easy. Now, there's an uncomfortable, but just as legitimate third option. And that is to remain with a leg in each part of the chasm. Now, this could be for a moment or it could be longer. As I mentioned, it's not comfortable because it's stretching you in both directions. But I actually know many um, Catholic religious sisters and other members of different organizations, Jewish and Christian organizations, that their faith has changed and they've outgrown certain orthodoxies or dogma, but they believe they're called to be reformists and advocate for change within their community, the community that they love and grew up with. Now, this could be understanding our environment and the damage we're doing our environment. This could be under, this could be fighting for full rights for women in ministry. It could be fighting for LBGTQ plus rights, both in our community, in our home, and in our world, um, and many other values. These people suffer. And sometimes the chasm does become so wide that they get thrown over to the other side, just because of intransience of the institution that they, that they were in. But they did what was right. So all the options are options that we've all thought about in our life. And some things that we decided we're going to hold on to. So you know, I don't hold many the of the theological beliefs that I had as a child around Christmas. Don't you know, virgin birth and need for universal atonement. But I do cherish some traditions that we have. And you know, we understand that the holidays which include Christmas and include the important birth of Jesus, which is important in our, one of our main sources of information for us, 
but also for the world. And, um, but we also understand that there's other important holidays during that time. Certainly, the holiday that predates all of us, which is the festival, the darkness into light, the pagan holidays of that time, which is where Christmas was put into, because that's where the Romans had the large holiday. It was also Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, and also in the Hindu holiday, which includes light. So all of these holidays come together. Are we gonna absorb every holiday? No, but can we gather truths from each one? Of course. So we keep, our our, we keep some Christmas decorations, and we sing songs that are secular songs, Hanukkah songs, Christmas songs, solstice songs, and gather with our family, and on Christmas Day, we have friends over from various faith traditions or none, and we celebrate our time together. And that's what we hold on to. Um, some of you may know from your traditions um, that there are, in the Catholic and Methodist traditions, there is called the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Now, another time, I, I adapted the spiritual works of mercy, but I'll talk about that another time. But the corporal works of mercy, you're very familiar with, but they were important to how a Christian or Catholic would live out their life. And um, they are really concerned the material and the physical needs of others. So they are to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick, to visit the imprisoned and ransom the captive, and to bury the dead. And that was something that I learned as a child and that I kept through my adulthood because that's important to me in my ministry, in my life. So for example, just some, some brief examples, and these are no big things, but I remember in middle school, I walked my first 20 mile walk for hunger relief why they couldn't just do five, I don't know. But we all suffered, believe me, we felt the pain after 20 miles. Um, in high school, I ran our Thanksgiving food drives and I made sure that we got the most that we had ever gotten because I knew how important that was into our own food bank. Um, I worked and ran shelters for street youth for 12 years. So I really embodied these, I really kept those and kept them as a part of me. Um, these examples, when you think of our Arlington Food Bank, of what's done with both our garden and our collections, are examples of we do for the material needs of others. But then we take the last one and just a few examples of what have we added to our life. And this will be more in another day, but I wanted to talk about one thing about the corporal works of mercy is they really deal with the needs of others but they don't necessarily deal with the underpinning reason of why they need something. So I moved to the concept of social justice and added that working for justice and systemic change on the issues that lead to people having the issues that they have. Are they being ostracized? Are they being left out? Are they being um, prejudiced against because of who they are, because of the color of their skin or who they love. Those are the things that might be that we need to deal with. That's what we deal with, whether it's in eye care or our justice ministry. Um, so I took a step in faith of something that you co I couldn't necessarily see, but what one thing that struck me was some of you know that um, one of our famous Unitarian ministers and uh, transcendentalists Theodore Parker wrote something that Martin Luther King actually borrowed and other people borrowed. But in, 19, in 1853, he stated, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. I know the arc is a long one, and my eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of my sight. I can only divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. Now that's a faith statement, right? Not a fact statement. And so as Unitarian Universalists, sometimes we wanna delve in the fact, but it's okay to delve in the faith, something that we may not be able to prove rationally, but we can lean into with our faith. I brought in Buddhist principles and Stoic philosophy working on awareness, learning to live in the present moment, 
trying to have gratitude, not very good, for all things in my life, um, and working on my connectedness to others, because that's how I grow, and my connectedness to the universe and the divine. So I gained a better understanding of understanding life as energy, and understanding that some people call this higher energy God, some people call it the universe, but it transcends all of us, and it connects all of us. Now, I'm sobered by the fact that the universe really doesn't care about the Earth. We do, right, Alan? We care about the Earth. But the universe, you know, we finally realized after a few centuries that the Earth is not the center of the universe. <laughs> just like our children are not the center of our lives, right? Uh, well, try to figure that one out. Um, okay, so, um, but what did the universe do? The, what fascinates me in my growth is that the universe is continually expanding. It's growing. So even in destruction, because stars die, you know, Earth someday, the sun, okay, it continues to grow. So what does that do for me spiritually? What I love about it, it invites us to be part of the creative process. And that's exciting because we're part of that creative process right here on Earth. And that's what I grabbed. And I think when we talk about going back to what you started, I think I had that intuitively as a child. I love to create things and do things and make things. And that brought me back home that this is something that was important to me from the beginning. Now, what I would say is, it's not something I truly understand, but it gives me a desire to be part of that energy of the ongoing creation we are part of. Now, just today, think of Tim on the violin, Jeannie on the piano, Rob's trumpet, Hope's voice, and of course, Sharon when she's normally on the piano. Think of that creative spirit. Did it all uplift us? It was a spiritual moment. That's what I think is it connected us to them, to each other, to their gift. I mean, who doesn't have appreciation for their gift, right? And, but it also connected us to the transcendent. I mean, I was literally looking over the rainbow. I mean, okay, I mean, I literally like, I, it just brought me to a whole nother space. So what I see is that each of you have a story to tell. And what I want you to do, I want to offer you the opportunity over the next few months to informally share your spiritual journey, okay, with me, and also give you the opportunity if there's something that you want to, to help me and lead in a service about the spiritual journey, what's important, that we can do it more formally as well, because this is our journey together. Um, but today, I wanted to um, invite two people. Um, one, Sharon Scholl, who's been here as long as uh, the puppy Hector. Hector was born, uh, and, uh, and then one of our newest members, um, Paul Ellison, to share. Sharon's going to be uh, alive, and then Paul is going to share. Uh, as some of you know, Paul is in the Navy in, in, on a helicopter and whatever. He's not on a helicopter right now, but he's out of town, so he, he recorded his. So Sharon, would you share a little bit about some of your spiritual journey? In the interest of time, I want to make this short. But I have three suitcases that I live out of, packed at an early age, and its clothes are way out of style, but it, they still fit me really well. <laughs> and one is crammed with the members of my church youth group, about 25 strong, um, that uh, I was with all through my teens and early 20s, there are only four of us left, all in our 90s. But we are close, though we are geographically dispersed. That has been the deepest human relationships that, that I've had outside of family circle. The second suitcase contains my life as a church musician from about age 15 to the present. And <clears throat> it is so crammed with memories and manuscripts and uh, plans for the future and scripts that I have to sit on this thing to get it shut. <clears throat> and the third suitcase is labeled church. None of this flabby spirituality without religion nonsense. Church is spirituality in a hard hat. 
spreading mercy and goodness throughout the world. And so, despite the horrors committed in its name, I'm a church lady, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> and the fourth suitcase was abandoned years ago. Its contents were labeled theology and the word of God. But I got a new one, and I packed it down with biblical of scholars, ancient language experts, archaeologists, historians, all those folks who teach believable accounts of our faith traditions. And so here I stand with my four suitcases, hoping to spend my last brief time on this earth in your lovely presence. <laughs> And Crystal, do we have Paul on screen? Okay. New sound design guy, and uh, recently uh, joined Unitarian Universalist. Um, first, I just want to say I wish I could be there with you guys today. Um, however, I'm probably attending a Unitarian Universalist church with my family right around the same time as you guys are having service up in Tennessee. At least that's what I'm hoping to do. We'll see. You never know with a three-year-old what your schedule is going to be. Anyways, uh, Peter asked me to record this video for you guys and answer a few questions pertaining to uh, what today's sermon is about and today's theme. So here we go. The first one uh, is about what things from my religious past have I let go of. And um, I just want to first let you guys know I grew up um, Episcopalian, which for those who aren't familiar, it's basically Catholic light. You keep all the same traditions and basically the same service and liturgical hymns and all that kind of stuff, but uh, much lighter on the beliefs. Uh, for example, the Episcopalians were some of the first to allow female clergy and uh, homosexuals in their leadership as well. Um, and so it's, it's pretty similar to most other Protestant Christian religions um, and I do want to make it known that I was in a very conservative Christian family growing up. We, uh, we had to attend church every Sunday, Sunday school every Sunday, um, and there was basically no, no excuses or reasons we, we shouldn't go. So um, that kind of just gives you guys a little bit of an idea of my background. So a couple things came to mind when I thought about what things I've let go. First, um, the belief that Jesus and the Christian version of God is the only God. Um, that was something that was kind of beat into me, uh, you know, baptized as a baby and then confirmed as a young teenager that to believe that, you know, you have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven, right? Um, I don't think that's necessarily true anymore. I think, you know, God can be really more of a spirit than any one person or thing. Uh, and I believe a whole bunch of different um, possibilities for, for what God or a higher being can be. Similar to this is the belief that, um, that humans were made in his image, and that would kind of lead people to think that God is also human. I don't think that's true either. I think he's more of like a, a ball of light uh, is kind of how I imagine a, a God, and, and he's a spirit or a soul. And made in his image to me kind of means that like there's part of him in my soul and just part of him in everyone's soul, uh, and that's what helps us connect as humans. So the second question was what beliefs have I kept? Um, so, or modified. So the one I've kind of kept and modified is um, the uh, second of Jesus' uh, um, remodification of the Ten Commandments, and that was to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, the way I think of it now, though, is love your neighbor as how they would want to be loved. And that kind of leads me to, to bring up the golden rule, right? I was always taught, treat other people how you would like to be treated. But as I've learned, not everybody wants to be treated like I want to be treated. Everybody's a unique and individual so now I try to live my life by treating other people the way they would want to be treated, which is a lot harder because it involves getting to know the people first. And last, Peter wanted me to um, talk about something new that I've um, started to believe, and that is that I believe that there's, it's possible for all religions to be correct, and it's also possible for no religion to be correct. right? I think all the religions, at least the ones I've learned about, have very similar themes. They're about loving and connecting and treating everyone nicely and with respect. And I think that is a theme that we can all agree on. All right, hope you guys have a great day. See you soon.